The Cetus has been one of my favourite entry level 3D printers since it was launched on Kickstarter in 2016. But the 3D printing market hasn't stood still and with many entry level machines now available, where does the latest generation of this tiny printer fit in 2019? Well, instead of a standalone review, I thought I'd take the time to compare the Cetus Mark III to its previous versions, the Mark II and my pre-production Mark I, to see where it stands. Let's get started. How's it going guys? Angus here from Maker's Muse. The Cetus really is a perfect case study in what a product could look like if it was paired back to its bare necessities. Nothing on this thing is done for aesthetic purpose. There's no case, no fancy features. Heck, it doesn't even have an interface. Like I said in my pre-production review back in 2016, it is truly a form follows function affair. The standard Cetus has a print volume of 180 by 180 by 180 millimeters, and there's an extended version which gives you an additional 100 millimeters in Z height. However, just like the market, tier time hasn't been sitting idle either. And these three machines may look similar, but they actually have quite different components driving them. For example, my trusty pre-production unit from 2016 has high wind rails. However, tier time didn't end up going with that for production and instead went with IKO rails for the Mark I and Mark II units. And global demand for linear rails is apparently ramping up, so that's resulted in yet another change to the Mark III to Hiroshin units. And I can't really say anything bad about them, they seem to be smooth and precise enough. However, unfortunately, the Cetus had a price jump to $399 US for the standard version and $499 for the extended version. Ouch. For the Mark II, tier time tried stall detection instead of limit switches for homing and it does work pretty well, but over time the plastic components wear and you lose repeatability, uh, which is very bad, especially for your Z-axis. So limit switches are welcomed back in the Mark III, although I personally do really like stall detection. We just saw it on the B2X300 and it works very well. And for X and Y it's fantastic, but yeah, you need a very rigid and reliable frame to do uh, stall detection homing for your Z axis, because that first layer is oh so important. So if limit switches is the way to go, then I guess that's what we're gonna have. And onto a point of contention, the behavior of the printer after the print is complete or it's shut down. You see, the Z-axis is belt driven on the Cetus. So unlike a lead screw, there's no friction or resistance to it just falling straight down with gravity when the power is removed. And uh, yeah, the head would literally slam down into the print or the bed and ruin the print or the nozzle. Um, very poor design in my opinion. Interestingly enough, my pre-production unit actually has regen, so it actually drops the head slowly by using the motor's own back EMF. Um, but for the Mark II, it, for some reason they've used this hacky brake with a one-way bearing. It's very weird. But with that in mind, I'm happy to announce that the Mark III has proper regen braking to drop the head slowly once again, although it still has the weird one-way thing, but it doesn't need it. It actually drops the head very, very slowly and gracefully, which is fantastic and wonderful to see. I don't know why it took them this long. I would like to see the head actually move out of the print area and then drop. For some reason, it still stops above the print, but um, let's talk about that print surface, shall we? For a start, it's unheated, and secondly, it's rigidly attached to the linear rails carriage. And thirdly, it's coated in a really weird special adhesive. And man, is it pretty special? PLA sticks to it like nothing else. You actually have to be careful when you first get this machine to not injure yourself with that razor sharp spatula getting prints off. This kind of bed arrangement unfortunately does require printing with a raft. Now you can print raftless on the Cetus, but because it's a rigid bed with no adjustment, I don't really recommend it. But something pretty cool and unexpected from tier time is the range of accessories now becoming available for the Cetus, such as a heated bed if you really need it. They have a abrasion resistant nozzle, a replacement control board to run the machine using OpenGCode with SmoothieWare firmware, 
and there's even gonna be a touch off probe and even a screen addition. That's gonna be pretty cool to see in terms of upgrading this machine. The Cetus nozzles have changed a bit over time uh, with the latest one being these elaborate units of brass, stainless steel and silicon, though they are back compatible, which is nice. And actually they work really well. They, the machine comes with three sizes, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 millimeter, which is a nice range of options for detail and fast printing. And they all have PTFE inside. So they should accept a range of materials from the direct driven extruder. Uh, there are only ever run PLA through these machines because of course the bed is unheated but it's worth noting that these nozzles aren't really user serviceable. They're all sealed up and they will eventually degrade and jam and wear out. So it's worth grabbing a few spares when you get the machine to have them on hand because they're completely unique and you can't get them anywhere else. <laughs> but what about software to run the Cetus Mark III? Well, let me explain. This 3D printer isn't like a typical based on open source unit out of China. It's completely proprietary. Tier Time has been making 3D printers for a long time. They made my Up Mini back in 2012, which I just made a video on, which you can see here. And the thing is their whole ecosystem is closed. That doesn't mean you have to buy their filament, thankfully, there's no chip cartridge method. But if you like to hack and tinker with your 3D printers, this one, in my opinion, isn't really the one for you, although things are changing slowly. You slice for the Cetus using Up Studio, Tier Time Slicer. It's come a very long way through the years and it's very competent. In fact, the company has added a lot of functionality recently, allowing you to now do complete custom material profiles. You can add and remove supports manually, though it's a bit tedious still. And you can even slice external G-code and use their slicer to sort of pass it into what the machines understand, because they don't understand raw G-code in their stock form. And then there's that new cool TinyFab CPU, which runs Smoothieware firmware if you want to completely take control of the machine and remove the stock CPU. But without a screen, how do you interface with these machines? Simple, Wi-Fi. You could connect it via the typical USB type C port if you like, but Wi-Fi on the Cetus is literally the best thing ever. It can be buggy on occasions, but right now, for example, I have all of my machines available to my workstation upstairs. From here, I can initialize, withdraw or extrude filament and send files. I can switch easily between the machines and within a few minutes, send three models to three separate machines through the one interface over the network. School teachers and educators, do I have your attention? I can't express how much better in a busy environment the system is compared to using SD cards and physical storage media. Something I do disagree with though is the requirement to register the printer to the software. I really don't think it's needed and I would recommend this to be dropped by tier time for privacy reasons. I will also express one gripe with the functionality while I have your attention because I want it to be fixed soon. In the older version of up slicing software, you could change the number of perimeters around the model, basically how thick the walls are of the 3D print. And for some reason, you can't do it anymore in up studio. It's always just two perimeters. That's okay for light use models, but even if you ramp the infill up, this very thin skin of the part limits part strength quite significantly. Uh, so tier time, please fix this and add back this setting or add it in if it wasn't in Up Studio. But anyway, moving on to print quality. I really wanted to see how the units had changed over time from the pre-production all the way to the latest Mark III. So I printed the exact same model on each machine, starting with the simplest thing I have, which is a maker coin. The pre-production unit shows its age the most. The maker coin is pretty rough um, at the 0.2 millimeter layer heights. The walls are a little bit inaccurate and the top infill especially has little gaps in it. Um, the nozzles for the pre-production I have aren't compatible with the latest ones. It's just a slight height difference. So um, unfortunately this machine is definitely starting to show a little bit of, uh, little bit of aging. But the two coins between the Mark II and Mark III visually indiscernible. I can't tell any difference. If I mix these up right now, I would not know which is which. So that's promising. Next was a very simplified version of my Lattice Torture Cube test. It's just the parts that we care about. And again, you can visually see differences in quality between one, two, and three, with um, the two actually being the nicer one, surprisingly enough. The, the three has a little bit of um, 
a cooling issue on the sides that are further away from the fan perhaps. But yeah, the two is actually the cleanest and these both have identical nozzles from the same pack. So it's all down to the machine and the functionality. And interesting enough, two has a little bit of a better finish, but it's very, very minor. Um, you'd be hard pressed to tell. Both did a fantastic job on these overhangs. Most machines will struggle to do overhangs this steep. Both pulled it off, but I would say two edges out three in a little bit of better quality. And finally, the Geyer Anderson Cat, which is a great test of support material and surface quality and accuracy. Going back to the original, like I said, my poor pre-production unit's been through a lot and it definitely shows a lot of uh, small artifacts. Perhaps I need to clean the rails, perhaps the machine isn't as rigid as its brothers, but this cat isn't the best of the best. Going on to the two and three cats, the surface quality of the body of the cat, very, very clean on both models. Um, I perhaps would say that the three has a slightly better surface, but that would be up for debate. They have identical G code, so you can see where the seams are on both models and they really look pretty much identical. Testing support material on the Mark II, it breaks away with your hand as it always has. It's actually some of the best support material generation I've ever come across out of the tier time software compared to anything else. Um, that's fantastic. So let's see what the Mark III is like, getting it free from the base and pulling it up here, trying to break it off. A little bit harder to remove. Oh, there we go. I did have to grab some pliers to get the support off under the chin, but very, very easy apart from that. And lastly, my clearance and tolerance gauge. This one is disappointing and goes back to my issue with the slicer. You see, everything was free with a little bit of assistance down to 0.15, but it broke. Um, 0.15 delaminated and the top broke off, but it's still free after levering with a screwdriver. And it only broke because those walls are too thin and it wasn't strong enough. I usually print with three perimeters when I print this tolerance and clearance gauge. And that is the only reason I think it failed. So you can go down to 0.15 millimeter clearances on all of these machines. I've tested these two previously with a tolerance clearance gauge, but um, the slicer is, seems to be a limiting factor for those strength detail parts, which you do need sometimes. So that's the only reservation there. So where does that leave us? Well, I feel the Mark II printed perhaps a tiny bit better, but it doesn't have the proper limit switches for the Z height repeatability, which might become an issue in future. But really both machines are very, very close in their printing quality. So if you can pick up a Mark II for cheaper, then I would probably go for it. The Mark III is very similar in functionality, has slightly different rails, and it does have the head that drops slower, which is, which is very nice. But I mean, even though the, the thing is hacky on the side with the one-way bearing, look, I've got it tuned pretty well, you know, where it kind of locks in place. So that's not really an issue either. Being cantilever machines, they will all still suffer a bit with vibration at their extremities. So keep that in mind if you're printing fast, you might get a bit of vibration artifacts in your print, ghosting, that kind of thing. But you can print fine and slower to try to limit that as much as possible. And now it's time for my favorite bit of the review, the conclusion. I'm not gonna hold back. I would be lying if I said that I didn't have bias towards Cetus 3D printers. Um, I've even taken them on holidays with me. This thing's been everywhere, my original one. They're just so small, easy to run, and print reliably with decent quality. However, I do need to talk about that price point. $3.99 for a non-heated bed, medium to small print volume, no filament runout sensor, although it does have power recovery, which is handy sometimes. It's a really tough sell for most hobbyists who will simply gravitate towards the i3 style machines like the Ender 3 for basically half the price. I will say if you can get the Mark II for a better price, I highly recommend grabbing one because it prints the same, if not slightly better than my Mark III. But this is probably controversial. I don't think this machine's really for that hobby market anyway. I think it's for education and people who just want a small machine that prints. Let me explain. Instead of a school spending a few thousand dollars on a, some big 3D printer, why not get a load of Cetus's instead? For example, Ultimaker 3, fantastic machine, no doubt, but three and a half K. You could get eight of these for 400 bucks a pop. 
Parallel printing with eight of these things, you can handle a classroom worth of models with no issue and it's easily accessible through Wi-Fi or you can even use that app if you have an iPhone device. Unfortunately, it's not an Android, but it has an app for a 3D printer. It's pretty cool. And keep in mind, guys, there's no safety precautions. It's an open frame machine. It's very pared back. So you might need some sort of cabinet or something to keep it safe in an educational environment. But honestly, I think just a cheap cabinet with a glass front and you'd be having a pretty good time. The Cetus Mark III isn't the best Cetus ever. Rather, it's just a nice iteration and gradual improvement on the already proven design launched back in Kickstarter in 2016, a campaign which only raised $165,000 by the way. But hey, it delivered unlike a lot of other 3D printed Kickstarter campaigns. And if you want to purchase links for either the Mark II or Mark III, they are in the description below. And a full disclosure, Tier Time sent me the Cetus Mark III and these ones as well, free of charge for purpose of review and no money has changed hands and all opinions expressed are my own. And hey, if you found this video useful, maybe consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later guys, bye.